1980, you and I were both at MIT getting involved in brains and consciousness. Yes. So after all this time, you tell me what you think consciousness is. Well, my views are a bit unusual. I think that consciousness is fundamental in the universe. I think that it's not a product of space and time or anything inside space and time. I think that efforts to derive consciousness from space-time, either by identity theories or by causal theories, have proven ineffective. And I've been forced to take the view that consciousness is actually fundamental in the universe. Well, everybody who we worked with, every neuroscientist at right. MIT then and now, okay. would believe that consciousness is a product of our brain, and our brain is an accidental product of evolution, and right. that we have emerged to have consciousness for some fitness reason, and, um, and that's all it is. It, may not have been necessary and it, it, we have it and the reason we think it's important is because we have and we're asking the question. Well, I think the evidence for evolution is quite strong, so I don't question evolution, but no one's been able to give a theory about how consciousness could emerge from brain activity. And I, I you know, have to admit that I've tried myself for a long time to understand how brain activity could cause... Well, what is it about consciousness that, that causes you to make such a radical departure from everyone normal? <laughs> well, of course, um, I'm not the only one in the field that thinks that the problem is hard. So it's quite, quite common to think that the problem is very, very hard. And, and my departure from a physicalist attempt is it, partly there's a couple of reasons. One is um, it's a good search strategy. If you're trying to solve a problem and everybody's searching in one part of the search space, <laughs> yeah. if 99% of the researchers are in one part of the search space, yeah. that's not an effective search strategy. Okay, well, we need to have at least one or two researchers that are searching in a different part of the search space. And so I decided to jump out and, and look over in the consciousness of fundamental space. You must have had tenure first. I, I definitely had. <laughs> this is not something you do before you get tenure. So I, was, I, I played it safe on that. Uh, in that regard. But, but you know, now that I got tenure, that's what tenure is for. Uh -huh. Tenure is right. for allowing researchers to take serious risks to, to try enterprises that may or may not work. Yeah, that's and, great. And, you know, I, I readily admit that maybe I'm wrong, but okay. I'm willing to explore. So, what is it about consciousness that forces you to make this radical uh, uh, jump? The thing about consciousness is that it, partly it's first person subjective, whereas our descriptions in the physical world are tend to be more third person and what we would call objective. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this big gap that's known as a hard problem between, say, neural activity, which you can think of crudely as ions flowing through holes and membranes. Yeah, that's sure. roughly what's going on to right. a first approximation. And that causes the electrical activity, which is the, what we see in the brain, to cause information to flow back and forth between neurons. That's right. So all, all that. But when I have the experience of a green apple, uh, if you look in my brain, there's nothing green, hopefully, or I'm in deep trouble. There's nothing green in there, and if you look at the activity of the brain, it doesn't look like a green apple, and there's no direct connection that we can make between that activity and the actual experience as an experience of a green apple. So that's what's been called the hard problem. And by the way, the, you know, the notion that this is a hard problem um, has been known for centuries, right? So Thomas Huxley, in the 19th century, talked about this as the very, very hard problem. He, he said it's, it's, it's a, as mysterious as having a gin pop out of a bottle. <laughs> and John Locke talked about this problem in 1690, saying that he had no idea how to make a connection between our conscious experiences and any physical activity of our body. Yeah, but to, today, to be fair, there is a great deal of understanding of what's called the neural correlates of, of, yes. uh, of consciousness, where you can show, and in your field in visual perception, there are very specific things that occur in the cortex, different parts of the brain. When you see visual things, you see edges, you see lines, you see different yes. orientations, different cells fire in different frequencies in different ways directly related to what you see in the environment. So you see a lot of correlates. Absolutely. And this is data that Locke and Huxley did not have, that we've only gotten in the last couple, three decades. Right. And it's very impressive what we've found. I mean, we can find specific neural correlates of color perception, motion perception, and we know that if you have damage to area MT or V5, you can lose motion perception. Uh, V4, you can lose color perception. So we know there are these very, very strong neural correlates of, of consciousness. The question is, how do you go from those neural correlates to either a causal theory? How does that neural activity cause the experience to happen?
or uh, some kind of identity theory. I mean, can we say that conscious experiences of a green apple is identical to neural activity? But when you look at it, uh, no one has come up with a scientific theory that will make even the most basic prediction that says this kind of neural activity has to be the smell of a rose. It could not be the color red for these mathematically precise reasons. And if you make this small change in the neural activity, you will necessarily change to the taste of chocolate. Yeah, and that could be with one neuron or circuits of neurons, however you want to do it. You're free to choose. That, that, that's right. And nobody has any idea. No, not only no, that, but nobody has any idea what would be an idea. That, that's right. There's, there's no it's theories. It's not like you don't know which one is right or how to, how to adjudicate between different options. You don't even know, you don't have any option that could conceivably do that. that, that that's right. And, and there, Locke is right with us. In 1690, he said it's inconceivable. Even with all the data we've got today, it's still inconceivable. It's not just that we don't have scientific theories. We don't have remotely plausible ideas about how to do it. Suppose, this, this is a, just an idea, but it's not the real science. Suppose that we actually found that you experience a particular color of red, say red 31. If and only if this particular neuron, and we can name right. it, you know, it's neuron 6 billion 55, right. Right. fires at 30 hertz. Right. And, we, and it's this amazing discovery that in everybody's yeah. brain, neuron 1 billion <laughs> and 55, right. when it fires at 30 hertz, you right. experience red 31. Right. Well, you get your Nobel Prize, that's an amazing discovery. Right. But has that solved the problem that we're talking right. about here, about how does neural activity cause the experience of red? Not at all. Now the mystery is intensified. How could it be that sodium and potassium and calcium ions going through holes in membranes of this particular neuron causes my experience of red 31? Now the mystery is even more intensified. So the neural correlates of consciousness don't solve the problem. They make it more intense. Why should it be that consciousness seems to be so tightly correlated with activity that is utterly different in nature than conscious experience? And where do you go from there? Well, one direction that I go, so I, I spent a lot of time trying, like everybody else, to think of physicalist approaches to this, or functionalist approaches. Maybe consciousness isn't identical or arises from neurobiology per se, but maybe it's some kind of functional properties of the neurobiology. And, and again, it's, it's tempting. Uh, my degree was in artificial intelligence at MIT. I mean, we, we were doing functional models. And yet, I couldn't and nobody has yet been able to find a way to go from those functional models to a theory that gets consciousness coming out without a miracle occurring. What I don't want is a miracle at the, at the critical stage. Right? There are these functional properties of neurons, then c consciousness comes out, but I don't want to have a miracle happen right at that key point. Uh, scientists have to put their miracles up front, right? Okay. Those are our assumptions. We, we just put them on the table. These are our miracles, our assumptions. After that, it's no fair. It's not fair to put any miracle okay. anywhere else, especially not at the key point where consciousness emerges. And so it was because I didn't want to put a miracle there, and I couldn't think of a way to do it, starting with physical or functional primitives, assumptions, that I said, okay, let's back off. We have mind and body, consciousness and the physical brain. We've been trying to solve the problem, starting with physical or functional, and then getting to consciousness. What, what would happen if we start from the other direction? As a purely scientific and rigorous approach, so we're not talking about mysticism or anything like that, I'm saying, can we get a mathematically precise model of consciousness on its own terms? Where we have to then, you know, put down mathematical structures, um, not because they're right, but so that we're precise so that we can then find out why we're precisely wrong. So the idea is, let's put down a mathematical model of consciousness. Of course it's not gonna be right. That's what science always does. But you get it down there, at least it's rigorous. Now, you start to make predictions. You get a dynamics of, of consciousness. The test will be, can you derive quantum physics from it? Can you get the wave equation of a free particle? Can you get spinners? Can you get spin networks? Can you get quantum field theory out of it? Because if you can, then at least you have a mathematically precise solution of the mind-body problem starting in the other direction. So I don't want a hand wave. What I want is a mathematical model of consciousness that any mathematician would recognize is well-specified, that any empirical you know, scientist in the field would say um, is not completely implausible as an empirical model, you know, uh, uh, of the empirical data about consciousness. And then the real test of solving the mind-body problem is can I take that model and without any hand waves, no miracles, get 
say, quantum field theory popping out of it. That would then be a, a, a big bridge towards solving the line-body problem from the other direction. That would be the first pontoon over the, over the river. You'd then want to then colonize and, and do lots, lots of other things. We need to understand all of human psychology and how brain science relates to all aspects of human perception and cognition. But if we can get the bridge from a, a basic model of consciousness to, um, say, quantum field theory, now we've got something to build on. And that, that's been my project.